Welcome everyone. Today is Friday, May 20th, and this is the uh, Life Force Canada Agricultural <clears throat> Think Tank, where we are focused on the Canadian Restoration Plan. And uh, we're discussing all things related to our food and water security, a recording on foraging and wildcrafting. Okay, let's get started. Your food supplies are running low. You are surrounded by plants, but you have no idea which ones you can eat and which ones are poisonous. The earth fortunately is covered with plants we can eat, but some are toxic to us. In desperate times, people have turned to the cornucopia of nature to replace their grocery aisle. During the Dust Bowl, for instance, people ate one of the only plants still thriving, which was tumbleweed. But I don't recommend chasing down and eating tumbleweed. Knowing what plants you can forage from your environment is critical to your long-term survival. Please consider subscribing to our newsletter to give you updates and membership-specific content. Visit www.cityprepping.com forward slash newsletter, or click on the link in the description and comment section below to subscribe today. Enjoy the video. In a previous video, I covered 25 edible plants you can grow in your apartment. For this video, I want to focus on a lightning fast list of 25 plants you can forage from your environment. While many foraging videos focus on plants you can eat but may not grow in your area, I've tried to focus on plants that are easy to identify, have a wide if not coast to coast growing range, and grow in great abundance. I've also favored plants that have both good nutritional values, medicinal properties, or multiple uses. Before eating any wild edible plant, make sure you are 100% certain it is a plant you think it is. You absolutely should have a good book to help you identify it. Many plants have lookalike plants that may be toxic. In my list here, I've also tried to avoid any plants that have similar lookalikes. I will put some links to my favorite foraging books in the comment section below and in the description. Please make sure to read up on any plant you intend to consume. Some plants have strong medicinal properties or shouldn't be consumed by children or pregnant women. It's important to know everything you can about the food you're venturing to consume. Along with getting the foraging books, start foraging now. Identify the edible plants in your area. Make sure they aren't sprayed with herbicides or pesticides or naturally sprayed by animal urine. Some plants in the wild have a very strong or bitter flavor and take some getting used to. They also tend to be more nutritious in some cases than your store-bought produce. Learn to eat small amounts now with your regular meals. If you do make a mistake and eat something you shouldn't have, charcoal tablets can neutralize some poisons and you should, of course, seek some medical care. In an SHDF situation, however, you won't have the luxury of medical services. Don't wait to learn until you have no choice. Get a book on foraging in your area and set a goal of finding at least one plant and using it as food. If you do this once a week, you'll be an expert forager in a short amount of time. So let's get to it. Number one, guidelines for foraging and keeping healthy. Now, before I launch into the rapid fire list of 25 plants, let me first explain some basic guidelines for health, safety, and sustainability. First, make sure you're 100% sure of the identification. As I mentioned, there are lookalikes for some plants and some plants are toxic. Second, never forage in areas you may feel have been sprayed with pesticides. And third, never harvest so much of the plant it cannot recover or other animals can't take advantage of the plant. If you come across a patch of berries, for instance, don't harvest them all. Of course, if you're starving to death, you may need to take more, but you don't want the plant and habitat to suffer so much it can't recover. What if you needed to come back in another few weeks to gather more? I intentionally left milkweed off this list because the plant is not as easy to find as it was and the monarch butterfly relies upon it. Fourth, make sure you wash your food you gather from the outdoors with water and if possible, a vinegar or water bath to remove any bacteria. Placing them post-wash into direct sunlight can help kill viruses and some bacteria, and of course, cooking them is your best bet. Finally, while I try to focus on plants that can be eaten in their entirety, from root to aerial plants, note that some plants have leaves that are edible, but not the fruit. Some have edible fruit, but not the leaves, and some have root only that can be eaten. Know everything about the plant before you eat it. Forgers take the art of foraging seriously. So if you have other advice for newbie foragers, please leave it in the comments section below. So without further ado, here are the 25 plants for foraging. They are in no particular ranking because what you choose to forage is gonna depend heavily upon your environment and what you need to supplement your food stores. So let's begin. Number one, white and red clover. Some people know about using red clover to make syrups, but you can also consume the white variety of this common and easily identifiable plant. 
the entire above ground part of the plant is edible. The dry leaves and flowers have a slight hint of vanilla to them. Once you learn to recognize clover with its shamrock like leaves, you'll see it everywhere. Identify this one from the flowers until you know what you are looking for. It does look a little like wood sorrel, which is also edible, but should only be consumed in smaller amounts because of its medicinal properties. Number two, daisies. The greens and petals can be eaten and have medicinal purposes as well. Now they're somewhat bitter. Daisies have anti-inflammatory and mild astringent properties and have been used internally in tea form as an herbal remedy for the common cold, bronchitis, and other inflammation of the upper respiratory tract. In folk medicine, it was often recommended to eat the fresh leaves to stimulate nutrition uptake due to the bitter substances found in the herb. The fresh leaves, flowers, buds, and petals have a pleasant taste and can be used in salads or added to soups. Furthermore, the flower heads can be used in vinegar and as a substitute for capers. Number three, dandelions. Probably this one is the most identifiable of any plant on this list. There are some medicinal effects of this plant. It is said to help the liver remove toxins and it has a diuretic quality. The entire plant is edible. Younger leaves are less bitter than older ones. The roots can be roasted and ground as a coffee-like substitute. The flowers can be eaten raw, tossed into a salad, or sauteed. Number four, purslane. You likely have walked right by this plant in hundreds of lawns. The first time I saw it was at a farmer's market the same week I pulled a bunch out from my lawn while weeding. I remember thinking I could have eaten these. In fact, it is widely eaten throughout Europe, Asia, and the Middle East and Africa. It's an annual succulent with a slightly sour and salty taste, making it an interesting addition to the plate and palate. The entire plant, including the leaves, stems, flowers, and seeds are edible and have been used for thousands of years in different variations. Number five, roses. Everyone can identify roses, so it's a good one for our list. The petals can be eaten, however, the rose hips, the fruit of the rose that appears after the flowers drop, are actually a better source of vitamin C than an orange. Unfortunately, most roses get harvested and clipped back before getting to this stage. But in the wild or after a long period of non-maintenance, rose hips would be in abundance. One rose hip has the equivalent vitamin C of eight oranges. It has the equivalent vitamin A of 21 oranges. The rose hips can also be dried and powdered. Number six, wild grapes. Grapes are a vine that can grow throughout the United States. Some vines in the wild can grow up to 50 feet in length. Now, right off the vine, they're more tart than store-bought grapes. The leaves can be blanched and eaten as well. Remember foraging rules and be sure to leave plenty behind for the animals who have been eating off that vine for many years before you showed up. Number seven, cattail. Yes, cattail can be eaten. You can eat the shoots and stalks raw, but they're better fried. They have a mild asparagus flavor. The seed heads can be harvested for pollen, which can be added to flour. The roots can be mashed in water and dried to produce the flour. It's versatile and grows in many lakes and along most rivers. Number eight, kudzu. If you live in the South United States, you know this invasive plant. The flowers, leaves, and roots are all edible. The roots, like the cattails mentioned previously, can be mashed and dried to make a starch called Japanese arrowroot. Note that the seeds and pods are not edible parts of the kudzu plant. Number nine, aloe vera. The succulent aloe vera is 99% water, doesn't have much taste, which are two great reasons to seek it out in the wild arid regions. When applied to the skin, it blocks 20% of harmful UV rays, so it hydrates and protects from the sun. The very viscous gel can also be used to shave or soothe your skin. Number 10, prickly pear cactus, also known as nopalis, Spanish for paddles. This large cactus is very distinguishable from other cactuses. The needles can be burnt off and scraped with a knife, and the soft center eaten. This is also what they make cactus candy out of. The reddish fruit can easily be gathered and eaten later. It has a sweet but subtle flavor. Number 11, milk thistle. With large purple pink cushion flowers and soft prickly leaves, the milk thistle is hard not to notice. You'll need thick gloves and a knife or scissors to harvest the leaves. Ounce for ounce, thistles come out higher in fiber, protein, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, copper, zinc, and other nutrients than most typical vegetables. Once you strip the spines off, you can eat them raw. But relative to the artichoke, the smaller unopened flower head can be eaten the same way. Number 12, stinging nettle. Anything with stinging in the name can't be good, right? Actually, the stinging nettle gets its name because the leaves have tiny barbs that can irritate the skin. It makes a list here because it is easily recognizable. It has a decent nutritional profile 
and for the anti-inflammatory quality of the plant. Plants and leaves in boiling water. Number 13, sunflower. The two best things about sunflowers are, first, that the entire plant is edible from root to stalk to leaves to the all too familiar seed. The second best thing is that the sunflowers grow with incredible ease. They just need soil, sun, and irregular watering, and they grow like crazy. Number 14, acorns. Acorns have been eaten by indigenous Americans as early as recorded history. They're very tannic, so the green acorns can be boiled and drained. Indigenous people would grind dried acorn into flour and soak them in a running stream for a few days to release the tannins. The result is a very nutritious flour. In Southern California, you can easily find holes formed from smashing and grinding the acorns and boulders beneath large California native oak trees, especially where there's also running water. Number 15, fiddlehead fern. Fiddleheads or fiddlehead greens are the furl fronds of a young fern harvested for use as a vegetable. It is abundant in the Pacific Northwest. Saute them with a little butter and wild garlic. These coiled tips of ferns are the yet to spring leaves. They have a slightly nutty flavor. Number 16, coyote melon. From California through Texas, the coyote melon is edible and grows in abundance in some areas. It resembles a fist sized watermelon with a harder rind and more spear tip like leaves. The first time you find one, you'll end up probably turning to the person next to you to ask if they use deodorant. It stinks like body odor. The indigenous people called it the coyote melon because they reasoned that only a coyote would dare to eat it. Like I said, it's edible. If you need to eat to survive, don't walk by it. Number 17, lotus flower. The Asian lotus flower is now somewhat common to ponds across America. The root is edible and loaded with starch. It is similar to a crunchy potato, so it fries up very well. Number 18, amaranth. Amaranth is very recognizable by its very long conical purple flowers. The seeds are about the size of sesame seeds and can be eaten, dried, or raw. They're packed with calcium and protein. The leaves can be stir-fried as well. Considered a weed, it grows quite well in the wild in many climates. Number 19, wild leeks or ramps are a spring ephemeral, which means the leaves appear before the leaves on the trees appear. This makes them easier to spot. You can get the same flavor from just a leaf, so try to just clip one leaf from a two-leaf plant and remember where the ramp hatch is for the future. Number 20, wild onions or wild garlic. The real advantage to the salmon family is that they're easily identifiable both by sight and by taste. They are very bold in flavor and you can find them growing throughout the country. 21, morels. As with all mushrooms, consult someone more of an expert than you before consumption. There are a lot of toxic varieties and lookalikes, so make sure you know what you're eating. There are also a great many edible varieties. I only included the morel here because there aren't many mushrooms with such a distinctive honeycomb head. This makes it, in my opinion, the most recognizable. 22, coneflower. More commonly known today as echinacea, modern herbalists claim it boosts immunity. Native Americans have used it for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. The leaves and flower petals are edible. You can also dry the whole plant and break it up for tea. 23, wild blackberries and raspberries. If you live in one of the cooler climate zones where wild blackberries and raspberries grow, you probably grab these right off the vine. I include them in the list here because they are so recognizable. Some people just have to go out looking more carefully to find them. The blackberry leaf can be made into tea or used for poultice for wounds. 24, pine trees. The nuts and needles of pine trees are actually edible, refreshing, nutritious, and somewhat minty in flavor. Pine nuts have more calories than peanuts. If you've ever put up a tent under or near a pine tree at the right part of the year, and you were probably bombarded in a rain shower of bits of pine cones as squirrels dug out these little knots. The needles can be steeped in hot water to make a refreshing tea. Number 25, mulberry trees. Resembling a blackberry in shape, the mulberry can be white, lavender, or purplish black in color. A full grown old mulberry tree is a thing of beauty with enough berries to feed every bird and every human for miles around. You're lucky if you find one of these. It's a favorite of silkworms, and the berries can easily become one of your favorites. That's my 25. Remember the rules and guidelines for foraging in a healthy and sustainable way. Get a book and set a goal for yourself to use one plant per week. In this way, if you find yourself in desperate need, you will be equipped with the knowledge and know-how to find the plants, process, and prepare them for consumption. There's so many books that have plants for the common to obscure. Nature's Garden and Incredible Wild Edibles are kind of the gold standard. They're written by the same author who is really the expert on foraging. 
These books have the right mix of plants and details to get you started and keep you healthy. I also included two more links in the comments and description section below. If you have a good book that you'd recommend in your library, please leave the title in the comments section below. I'd love to check it out. The knowledge of foraging for edible plants will transform your world. It's a great activity for the whole family and it will take your nature hikes to a whole new level. So get out there and get to eating nature. If you have any comments, anything you'd like to share or any foraging tips or recipes, please feel free to leave a comment in the section below. Try to read as many of the comments and respond to them when I'm able to, and that's usually within the first hour of releasing the video. Remember that there are links in the description section below where you can find more information about things I discuss in this video. If you'd like to be notified when other videos become available, you may want to subscribe to this channel. As always, stay safe out there. So, welcome back. Um, first uh, plant that he talked about was um, tumbleweed. <laughs> that was a big surprise to me. Anybody heard any stories about uh, eating tumbleweeds? <laughs> so, um, yeah, share with us uh, what your experience has been with um, foraging, what you've, what you've tried, what you're interested in trying, what you know is uh, growing uh, locally in your area. I don't mind jumping in. Um, okay. Asparagus is supposed to grow wild and it's supposed to be in my area and I've never found it, but uh, very curious about that and would be interested in trying, say wild asparagus. But <laughs> yeah, that's you can find one, out. That's one that um, I found um, in our ditches the last couple of um, years. I've um, uh, gone and collected it and it, you seem to um, have to make sure that you're looking at the right time right because if it gets too mature or um, you know too late in the summer then that would be the thing that I would um, I would look for is uh, yeah that you're searching and collecting it at the right time so um, and I haven't actually eaten it yet what I did do was chop it up and uh, put it in the freezer so I thought uh, I was going to make some asparagus soup, but I haven't done that yet. So, and it is on my calendar to be out there searching pretty soon for it again. Hi, sorry I was late. Uh, out walking my dogs with a friend who's a an avid forager, so we've been checking out mushrooms and different other fungi, mm -hmm. and I'm scoping neighborhood yards for dandelions. Uh, saw one on the way home from the dog park a few minutes ago that's peppered so I plan on eating them this year blossoms and uh, leaves hopefully and as long as my dogs don't pee on them too much mm -hmm. anyway uh, and I'm gonna dig up a few roots I don't want to dig up too many roots obviously because uh, then that kind of kills the purpose of having them so I'm out in my yard I'm working on my last two garden boxes so <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I, I've been on mute uh, because I've been cutting wood while the video was going on. So I'll have to rewatch the video, obviously. Dorothy, do you want to um, just move your camera around so people can see the boxes? Those haven't been uh, on Telegram. Uh, not, oh, there it is. Okay. So here's, here's my lumber that I've got one more board to cut, as you can see for, oh, I got one on the saw too. So I got two more boards to cut for the, for the last two boxes. These are my boxes. This is just, see my lovely fence here? Uh, I did that after our fire in 2016. So I kept the ends. My brother brought over some really long boards for us to use so I kept all the ends in the basement for the last six years and I thought what a perfect use for them all I had to buy was two by fours I even had the the decking screws so anyway I got my cardboard in there and some twigs and I if I get these boxes finished this afternoon a uh, gal that stays with me occasionally um, wants to come and bags of soil mix it up in uh, my I've got a bunch of bins of compost too. All the stuff that I, I planted in on the deck last year, they're all full of compost and, and soil mixture. So that's next. Once I finish these two boxes and I it shouldn't take me nearly as long to do the last two as it did the first two. So 
Anyway, so uh, hopefully I'll be ready by for a nice warm weekend by the time it gets here tonight. Awesome anyway. job, Dorothy. Thanks. Anyway, that's all I got to share right now. My poor plants need to be outside someplace now. I've been bringing them out in the sun, but yeah, it's been cold here at night. So my poor potatoes, mm -hmm. you can maybe see those are not looking so great now. I put them in cardboard boxes. It was suggested. And... Okay, thank you. Um, I, I do apologize. I did come in a couple minutes late. Did that? Uh, did the video cover fireweed? Uh, no, I did not talk about fireweed. Oh. So tell us what you know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So everybody, I suggest writing that down. It's called fireweed. It's the first plant that comes up after any fire, whether it be a prairie fire or a forest fire. It's a creator's gift to us after a fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can eat all parts of the plant. Uh, the, the flowers, uh, when they flower, people make um, fireweed jelly. There are all sorts of even communities with uh, about this one plant called fireweed. And fireweed saved my life because I was uh, anemic and it is highly uh, high in iron. So uh, four leaves of the, the um, fireweed can uh, pulled me out of a, an anemic coma, which was pretty incredible. And I had just gone on a medicine walk just that weekend prior to learning about it. I knew I was sick, but I didn't know exactly what was wrong with me. And it turned out that I was anemic. So uh, the roots, of, so you can dry that. Uh, they, they grow quite tall. You can also get them as shoots um, and you can eat the leaves as well too. just saute them up if you need a little bit of iron. There are many other things that it, it does, but there's so much to go through. This is a, a day course really on one plant. Mm -hmm. the, the roots of the fireweed are deep into the, the soil. They're about a foot down, which means that it takes some labor to get them out. But when you get them out um, and they are dried and you can powder them, they are equivalent to a Tylenol-3. Wow. And mm -hmm. the roots on this plant are quite, um, for, for us wanting to figure our our way out through the forest if we get lost. If we find the fireweed plant, the roots only grow east-west. Hmm. And so in relationship to where you're standing in the sun is, you can orient yourself simply by appreciating the root growth of the fireweed. And that's really important to know. There's lots of it out there. Um, I would suggest don't pull any things out of gutters uh, if on the side of the road because they're highly polluted. Uh, yeah. There's so many chemicals yeah. that are going on our yeah. roads and all that stuff now. You know, you could see a lot, but really think about where you're, you're going to be foraging. And the best place is to go deeper into the forests, of course, where you have pristine lands. And uh, hopefully, well, I mean, there's always the chemtrails, but let's try not to think about that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but the, you know, the fireweed will pop up. You'll see it on the on the most unusual places. Sometimes it grows on the side of the rocks. Sometimes it grows deep in the forest, depending on where there might've been a fire um, or wherever the seed has planted itself. The seeds are, are really fun. They're kind of like fluffy feathers. And when the seed pods explode, they're just all over the place, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, the other plant that they did talk about was the dandelion. And also, I mean, there's dandelions everywhere, but you know, the city is spraying. So be careful again, you know, you might see the dandelion one day, it might look good. And then, you know, the next day or the next couple of days after all the other ones are wilted and that's because they've sprayed something on them, but you don't want to, you don't want to put that stuff into your body. And again, the dandelion, of course, you can eat the entire plant. Um, and it's wonderful for just so many different things. And I won't go through that, but that's all that I have to say. Thank you. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you. That's great. Um, Katika, you had asked about the link to the video. I have uh, put it into the, uh, uh, into the chat and I'll also be posting it on Telegram. So, and uh, Thanks. if you have any good, um, links ancient brown bear on the uh fireweed if you want to post them in the chat or um yeah again great information that you provided thank you um 
And can I, I posted put... some in the chat, Karen. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, Katika, yeah, do you want to try speaking now? Um, you'll have to unmute because yeah, I, I can't hear you. I had the external um, um, speaker um, attached to my iPad, so it didn't work with my microphone, so I turned that off. I hope you hear me now. We can hear you. Okay, so I was also about to speak so, uh, something about the dandelions, uh, just to add a couple more facts. Um, so yeah, the whole plant is very edible, uh, but I want to, oh, shoot. Do you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Do you hear me? Sorry, I, it's, this thing started appearing, so I thought my connection was done. Oh, anyway, sorry. I want to add something about roots. So my father got a prostate cancer uh, several years ago. He's an older man now. And of course it gets slower and older man, but he was eating raw uh, dandelion roots. So it didn't help or not, but he doesn't have cancer now. Just want to add that. Wow. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, we need to get out there and um, <laughs> eating those dandelions. So, um, Okay, um, Douglas, we'll get to you in just a second. Um, whoops, I keep losing this. Um, how to test unknown plants. Can you see my screen? Um, there's lots of um, recommendations that we need to look at and pay attention if we are foraging uh, for plants that we're not familiar with. And uh, I will post this on um, Telegram and also in the chat. Um, let me just scroll down here. Oh, what am I doing? I keep losing it. Um, anyway, I can't get the whole thing on the screen here. Um, anyway, really important to pay attention um, again, to the plant that you are uh, foraging for if you're not familiar with it. And there's so many good resources either in the books or online. So we want to be just really, really careful. Again, whether it's mushrooms or other plants that we're not familiar with. So um, yeah, Douglas, you go ahead. You had your hand up. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, I've been eating dandelions for the last two weeks and um, really like the uh, flower because of the uh, pollen and the, the uh, nectar and the, um, the, the flowers themselves are very packed with a lot of good nutrients. Um, the, uh, we've been uh, drinking our uh, maple sap earlier in the spring and uh, right after this, uh, this meeting, I'm going out to harvest um, the uh, spruce buds. So the early sp uh, spruce buds that come out are delicious. I, I actually had them in the freezer all winter, so I was eating them all winter. And uh, now the fresh ones are just out on the, on the uh, spruce trees. Um, so picking the lower, the lower buds, which is the, the leaf bud. And uh, it will, um, um, if you harvest it just at about, um, say less than a centimeter long, um, then um, you can steam it or you, you can actually eat it raw too. It's just uh, very delicious. And uh, one thing I wanted to go over was, um, you know that the indigenous um, polyculture orchards, the oak, the butternut, the um, weed butternuts here all year round, the butternut uh, uh, walnut. And um, so, uh, but um, indigenous uh, polyculture is about 100 times or about 10,000 percent more productive than agriculture and much, much easier and maintains the water, the water table and neutrifies the soil and recycles uh, deep, deep minerals in the soil. So if anyone's interested in um, uh, polyculture orchards or orchard food production efficiencies, I put a post into the chat and um, in there, you'll see the calculations. Uh, I've been involved in agriculture and uh, indigenous harvesting uh, from the uh, from polyculture over oh 55 years now, and um, it's very very uh, productive and much more productive than agriculture. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, thank you for putting those links in the chat as well. Um, can you also put um, anyone is sharing the links in the chat if you want to post them on the uh, on the telegram as well. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at the time here, as I indicated at the start of the call. Um, we are limited today to um, 40 minutes. And uh, so if we get cut off and you want to come back in and continuing the conversation, then uh, then please do that. So we've got about five minutes left before um, Zoom cuts us off. So like I guess say, if you want to come back in, then uh, just give it about a minute and hop back on the call. So who's next? Oh, I got a little video I wouldn't mind sharing. It's just about composting. Okay. It's, this is a composter that I built. And I'll just play this video. It's basically a food grade barrel, <clears throat> plastic barrel. And in order to compost properly, you're supposed to turn your compost. Well, it, every day would be good. And this is just an example of some way to make it easier to stir your compost. I've had this for a long time. I got two of them. Then you just uh, close the lid, lock it up and give it a spin. And that helps you to stir your compost. So I know uh, Dorothy, she's talking about composting as well. This is something that I found very easy to do. And then it's easy to spin the stuff. And I also have two raised beds, five by 10. And that's about it. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, and we will be doing um, a call one of these weeks just on uh, composting and mulching. So glad you uh, glad you brought that up. Um, again, we've got about three minutes left. Uh, if we get cut off, then give it about one minute and then click on the same link and come back oh, and call if you want to continue the conversation. So here we go. <laughs> it's growing wild right in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> that's just microgreens flax <clears throat> and i've got all sorts of other stuff going on but... yeah um for on the compost thing um one of the things i've been using in the city and the uh, the greatest uh, reluctance to composting is actually rats and other rodents and so i've been using um a 35 dollar sheet of um cement board which is one of the cheapest ways to make a, a composter that lasts forever and ever and ever. I, mine has lasted 11 years with now without any degradation. And it also, for those living in the country, worried about bears, uh, worrying about attracting rodents, um, cement board, um, you'll see in the, in the uh, chat section, the, uh, the web link to a picture of the cement board composter, which anybody can build for next to nothing. That's awesome. Anyone else? Um... Again, we've got a minute and a half left and uh, when the call ends, just give it a minute and you can click on your Zoom link and come right back into the call if you wanna continue the conversation. Okay, well, I guess I will go ahead one and uh, I will stop the recording. We'll end the call for today. And uh, like I say, I'll jump right back on in a minute. So if anyone wants to continue, then I will be there. Thank you very much for showing up, everyone.